Good afternoon and uh, a big welcome to you all, wherever you're joining from around the world. It's a beautiful day here in London, but we're not talking about the weather. Today we're talking about climate change and especially its impacts on health. My name is Anthony Costello. I am a Professor of Global Health at University College London and Chair of the uh, Lancet Countdown. And I just want to let you know that we've got a fantastic program for you today. Um, first, we're going to be hearing uh, some keynotes from uh, brief keynotes from Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, from Tamara Lucas, um, uh, an executive editor from The Lancet, who has for many years given us fantastic support in producing these reports. Then we'll hear from the Right Honourable Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, who will set the political context. And then we'll go over for a, a slightly longer session with Dr. Marina Romanello, our colleague who has uh, led the authorship of this multi-author report and has done a brilliant job as head of our research and data section. And then after that, we will um, have some uh, contributions from people around the regions about the impacts of uh, uh, climate change on health from China, from uh, small island states, uh, from Europe, uh, and also from uh, South America. And then we will move into a, a lively panel discussion. Uh, and we have, we'll have five people answering questions that I will set, but also there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, as well. First, I'd just like to set the scene for what this report is. Uh, perhaps we can have the next slide. <clears throat> so we have had the Lancet countdown running for the last six years. And before that, we had two commissions that came out uh, in which we described climate change way back in 2009 as the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. And a few years later as the greatest opportunity for health in the 21st century, because everything that you do for climate change uh, should be good for your health. So next slide. Uh, we've now built up an amazing coalition of 43 universities, uh, over 90 authors to the report, with some amazing institutions, universities and research institutes involved. So this is truly now a global operation. And we have, as you will learn, five regional hubs producing their own regional reports and policy briefs as well. Next slide. Uh, essentially, we have five working groups. Uh, the first working group, the purple one, is looking very much at the health impacts of climate change. Uh, the second one is how we might build in adaptation. That's the green one on the left. Uh, the, uh, and also the health benefits of mitigation. Uh, which are extremely important to persuade policymakers of. We also look at the economics of climate change and indeed the political context and the public engagement. And in each of those working groups, we have indicators of how we're making progress, which we're going to describe to you a little later. And uh, we've now got 44 indicators. Next slide. Um, as I said, the, there's a large team of global collaborators. This was the last meeting in person a couple of years ago. Uh, but now, next, um, the uh, <laughs> virtually everything is done, as in everything else with the pandemic, online. And so it's been a little bit more tricky, but also much more zero carbon. And uh, I cannot thank all the contributors enough for the work they put in, mostly voluntary, and uh, that's why we've got such a, an interesting uh, report. Next slide. So we've got 22 local launches taking place in addition to this global launch all over the world. And that's extremely important because we want people to relate to their own local context as well as to the overall uh, global issues. Next slide. And just to say, when you go onto the website, either the Lancet website or our own Lancet Countdown website to download the report, you will also find that we now have 12 country policy briefs where our partners in countries 
have described the context in their own language and their own work about what uh, climate change is meaning for their health situation. I'm especially grateful to Stella Hartinger for the work she's done in pulling together several uh, uh, policy briefs from Latin America to add to our international ones. And in the coming years, we'll expand that as well. But now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who's going to say a few words about the importance of this report. The climate crisis is upon us, powered by our addiction to fossil fuels, with real and devastating consequences for health, particularly for the most disadvantaged. The 2021 Lancet Countdown report documents this destruction of lives and the inequities that cause in clear detail. This year, we also see how the COVID-19 crisis has hampered the health response to climate change and that too few countries have taken the opportunity to build forward greener from the slowdown in their economies. But it also documents some of the progress that's being made and particularly encourage that millions of health workers around the world are stepping up and making their voices heard on climate change. Health workers have also contributed to the recommendations that WHO is sending to the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow. Vaccines may be helping to bring COVID-19 under control, but there is no vaccine for climate change. The health arguments for rapid climate action have never been clearer, and it's clear that the public health benefits from implementing ambitious climate actions far outweigh the costs. The Lancet Climate Countdown is an essential scorecard for how our work is going. I hope this year's report elicits the action we so urgently need. I thank you. Thanks very much, Tedros. Um, uh, as ever, very to the point, and it's extremely important to have the voice of the World Health Organization, and they've been brilliant collaborators in this effort. The next person we're going to go to is Tamara Lucas. She is an executive editor at The Lancet, and she really is the person who holds our hand through this process. And she's done an amazing job because getting a each report each year kind of oven ready takes a lot of editing and a lot of help. And we're enormously grateful to her, not only for that, but because she's a brilliant cake maker. And I'm hoping that after this pandemic of cake deprivation, we shall have a chance to meet up again in the near future and have a cup of tea and a piece of cake. Over to you, Tamara. I'm delighted to be here, not even 11 months since we launched the last Lancet Countdown annual report at such an exciting and pivotal time. The authors and partners involved in the report, led by Anthony and others we'll hear from over the next two hours, have once again produced an outstanding and important piece of work, and The Lancet is very proud to publish it today. Launching this report, Code Red for a Healthy Future, just 10 days before COP26 begins, really does feel like the last and best opportunity to set the path to global zero carbon by 2050. It's also a very fast moving field, with day after day of new reports and perspectives being added into the global conversations. But The Lancet Countdown Report is unique and adds something both different and important to those conversations. As an independent monitoring system, the 44 indicators show that trends continue to get worse and the health outcomes are exacerbating existing global inequities. There are many reports coming out ahead of COP26, including the WHO report last week, the UK government net zero plans and the WMO's state of the climate in Africa and so on. The implications for health underlie every single point that is being made in each of these reports. And those implications are perilous and potentially devastating, as set out in this latest Health and Climate Countdown. While the outlook is poor and the trends extremely worrying, Countdown does also give us glimmers of hope for the future. We know that engagement and awareness of health and climate are increasing. 
we know that the next generation of leaders and youth activists are motivated to save the planet and halt destruction from human overconsumption. The Lancet Countdown is also part of a network of civil society initiatives, holding policymakers and governments to account. So coming to the climate emergency is not inevitable, and through partnerships and initiatives such as Countdown, there is hope of a way forward. And finally, once again, I would very much like to thank all of the authors, Anthony in particular, the 43 partner institutions and the leadership of the Lancet Countdown. At the Lancet, we are so extremely honoured to work with you throughout the year to bring this report to fruition. That extends across the whole team that touches the report during its publication journey. And personally, I'm also very excited and humbled to hear the discussions of this impressive group of experts that you've assembled today. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Um, our next speaker is, well, she needs no introduction. Uh, it's the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who's a former Prime Minister of New Zealand, formerly Director of the UN Development Programme. She is President of Chatham House. She is Chair of the Partnership for Maternal Newborn and Child Health. And she's arguably one of the most experienced statesmen in the world. And we've asked her to just say a few words, particularly about the political context uh, and what's leading up to COP26. Uh, Helen Clark. We are all indebted to the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change for once again, spelling out the gravity of the climate crisis and its implications for the health of humankind. In the years since the last report, we've been witness to yet more tragic news of terrifying floods and fires and the destruction of lives, homes and hopes, which always accompany such deeply traumatizing events. Less in the headlines, but also deeply troubling, are the mounting impacts on human health of the rising risk of vector-borne diseases, of water supplies under pressure and of air polluted by fossil fuel propelled transport, energy generation and industrial production. Then month in, month out, those living on low-lying islands and vulnerable coastal areas experience the impacts of rising sea levels. Those exposed to adverse weather events from the world's drylands to the tropics experience the volatility of uncertain seasons and the impact of those on their capacity to produce food and enjoy human security. All of these impacts are well understood by the audiences drawn to the launch of a Lancet report. The challenges to communicate their seriousness to those with the power to ensure that nations change course towards sustainability and work collaboratively to realize the vision and ambition of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In just 10 days, world leaders will convene in person and virtually for COP26 in Glasgow. Will they rise to the challenge of making this COP the success which Paris was and build on the vision and commitments of 2015? Or Will they walk away uh, from a debacle on the scale of Copenhagen in 2019? The latter is surely unthinkable. For the sake of the health of the world's peoples and of our planet, we need leaders to commit in Glasgow to do whatever it takes to keep the rise in the global average temperature well below two degrees and ideally below 1.5 degrees, as was agreed in Paris. We will need more ambitious commitments, and we need action on those commitments. I know that climate action is hard. I've been in the hot seat as a leader, trying to move things forward in the past. Change is always hard, and we're asking populations to change a lot about the way they do things. But countless reports have pointed the way to achieving a zero carbon future through how we organize our transport, energy, and our agricultural, industrial, and waste systems, as well as our urban and building design. Zero carbon is feasible. 
It needs resourcing for just transitions at home and for global solidarity for those in low and middle income countries seeking the means, the technologies and the capacities to advance sustainability. Leaders and negotiators should go to Glasgow armed with the Lancet countdown report in hand and resolve to make the decisions which will give the people of the world hope for a future that isn't blighted by climate crisis. There is a better way. And the Lancet Countdown's documenting of the serious health impacts of climate change tells us why we must find that way and act on it and act fast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, I think she's absolutely right about COP26. This is going to be a huge political challenge and, and politicians have a difficult job, but we, we have to move. And I hope that we will also share, in addition to the report, our 12 policy briefs, which highlight the specific problems in different countries. And I'm hugely grateful to my colleague, Dr. Francis McGuire, and all the people that coordinated those policy briefs because they bring flesh to uh, the, the, the outline of the, the main report and the main indicators. But I want to turn now to another of my great colleagues, Dr. Marina Romanello. Uh, she's from Argentina, but she's been in the UK a long time. She's a population scientist, health scientist, and she's done an amazing job in pulling together as our head of research and data all of the indicators that are being collected by different groups around the world. And she's going to outline the key findings of this year's 2021 report. Over to you, Marina. Thank you so much, Anthony, for the introduction. Thank you for everyone for being here. I hope that you will be able to see my screen. There we go. All right. So as Anthony said, I'm going to walk you a bit through our report this year. The 2021 report, uh, 2021 report of the Lancet Countdown is actually the sixth report that we've done as the Lancet Countdown, and it's the fifth report for which we have data and indicators. Each year, with the amazing team of over 90 uh, authors that we have, we've been refining and improving on our indicators and adding new indicators to our to, to give a fuller picture of the health dimension of climate change. This year we have three new indicators and we've also started to include considerations of what the impact of climate change is in terms of um, gender inequities. And also by stratifying our indicators according to the United Nations Development Programme's Human Development Index, we have also been able to expose inequities between countries in different levels of Human Development Index or HDI. I'm going to try to walk you through some of our key findings, but bear in mind that I'm fortunately just the lead author of this report, but this is the work of 90 world experts from around the world. So I hope I will do justice to the enormous effort that they have all put into this. The first finding, the one that comes immediately, is that the 2021 report gives a code red for health. In every one of the indicators in which we track impacts, we're seeing alarming signals they are flashing red with health impacts worsening year on year. When we think about climate change, the most obvious things to come to, that comes to mind is extremes of heat. We've seen this year record heat waves in the Northwest USA. We've seen in Canada uh, reaching almost 50 degrees, the same in Sicily, in Russia, in Kazakhstan. And while we know that heat waves are a problem, they're particularly problematic to the very vulnerable, to people that are over 65 years of age or the very, very young, those living with underlying health conditions. They are the silent killers. They can tip people over the edge and exacerbate um, heart disease, lung disease, lead to acute kidney injury, uh, or even lead to um, stroke and death ultimately. What we do with this is through remote sensing tools, track the people over 65 years of age and under one year old that are exposed to days of heat wave. And as you can see in both graphics, the exposure is going up really rapidly, particularly over the past 10 years. In 2020, we've seen 3 billion more person days of heat wave exposure in the over 65 age group than in a baseline that finished just 16 years ago. Obviously, with exposure to heat waves also comes heat related mortality. And we also have an indicator that exposes that 
in 2019, there was a record heat-related mortality, 80% higher than in the early 2000s alone. Besides the mortality and the morbidity associated with heat, heat also undermines our capacity to work, our livelihoods. It's, when it's too hot outdoors, obviously, the workers that are more exposed to the elements suffer the most. And what we have seen is that around the world in 2020, almost 300 billion hours of potential work were lost due to the extremes of heat. I want you, however, to look here at the breakdown between different uh, human development index or HDI groups. It is the low and medium HDI countries that saw the biggest losses of hours of potential work. And especially the losses were felt in the agricultural sector, the very vulnerable uh, workers that work to produce food in, the, in agriculture. When we look at the low HDI group, obviously this translates to potential losses of earnings. And in the low human development index country group, this was equivalent to four to 8% of the GDP of those countries being lost as a result of exposure to extremes of heat. So heat is affecting us directly and indirectly. With the rising temperatures and with rises in drought, which we also track in our report, also comes an increased risk of wildfires. There's no number, there's no indicator that can speak to the images that we've seen this past year of the wildfires in Canada, the wildfires in Greece, in Turkey, in Siberia. We've seen the devastation of people losing their homes, losing their livelihoods, the direct exposure, the burns, and the exposure to the smoke that obviously also exacerbates lung disease um, and chronic conditions. No number can capture this. But again, we try, we're scientists, so we try to monitor things. What we do is use remote sensing technology, again, to try to track exposure to, heat, uh, to wildfires. And what we have seen is that in 2017 and 2020, on average, 72% of countries saw an increased uh, level of human exposure to, heat, uh, to wildfires with respect to the early 2000s alone. 60% of countries so an increase in human exposure to days of really high wildfire danger that is determined by the climate, by the dry, hot conditions. As the climate changes, this is getting worse. And each time we see worse and more intense and more extensive uh, wildfire seasons. And of course, after a whole year of a devastating pandemic, we can't forget about infectious diseases. As the climate is changing, the environmental suitability for transmission of diseases also does. This will particularly affect um, those diseases that are transmitted by the water, by food, by air, or by arthropods, by mosquitoes, for example. Here I'm giving you just one example, but we have others in the report. Um, looking at dengue, dengue is a leading cause of serious illness and death in Asian and Latin American countries in particular, and is the most uh, rapidly spreading vector-borne disease in the world. It is estimated that about half of the world's population today is at risk of dengue, and it can lead to very serious disease and to death. What we're seeing is that because of the changes in temperature, in precipitation and in humidity, the transmission potential for dengue is increasing between 7 and 13%, depending on the vector around the world in 2020, with respect to an, a baseline of the 1950s, 1954s. And if you look here, it is in the Americas and the Western Pacific, two areas where dengue is a big problem that we're seeing the biggest increases. So I've shown you the devastation uh, through some of the indicators, but we're also tracking um, the hours loss of safe physical activity due to extreme temperatures. We're tracking heat-related mortality, lethality of extreme weather events, the losses of marine food security, the people at risk of sea level rise, the reduction in crop yield potential, and the area affected by droughts. And in all of our indicators, we're seeing the effects of climate change on human health increasing. What is very important to note is that no one is left unaffected, but those people in communities that are extremely vulnerable, those that are vulnerable to food insecurity, to water insecurity, the elderly, the ones that have underlying health conditions that make them particularly vulnerable to extremes of heat, those that are uh, at risk of infectious disease spread, those are the ones that will be the most affected. And climate change is therefore exacerbating the inequities around the world. 
And just as we've seen the world failing to deliver an equitable response to COVID-19, an equitable outrolling of the COVID-19 vaccine, we're also seeing deep inequities in the way that the world is responding to climate change. We know that rapid decarbonization could deliver health benefits through cleaner air by reducing the burning of fossil fuels, healthier diets by transitioning away from ruminants and red meat consumption, and more active lifestyle if we transition from fossil fuel transportation to active ways of travel. However, we're also seeing that those countries that perhaps contributed the least historically to the climate um, crisis are also the ones that today are taking the least benefit from an accelerated response. It is crucially important that as all of these health risks keep on increasing, countries do prepare to cope with health emergencies. What we track uh, in the indicator I'm now showing is the number of countries that report having implemented a national health emergency framework, which is mandatory uh, according to the international health regulations. And we see that just 75% of countries reported medium to high levels of implementation of the national health emergency framework. This framework is essential for countries to be able to cope with health emergencies, to cope with the, with the health hazards that climate change is bringing about as well as to cope with a pandemic, for example. What is interesting, and I want you to see this graph here, is that there's big um, differences between the implementation in countries within the low human development index group and those within the very high human development index group, with those in the low HDI group reaching just about 50-55% of implementation of this framework, same as the medium human development index group, whereas the very high human development index group is reaching about 90% of implementation of the framework. This means that those countries with the lower levels of HDI that are already vulnerable are not preparing to protect their people as much uh, from the potential health impacts of uh, health emergencies. But obviously it's not enough to adapt, it's not enough to prepare to cope with health hazards. We also need to rapidly transition towards a low carbon economy and to decarbonize our, our global systems. Looking at the energy system, that is the biggest contributor to uh, greenhouse gases, I'm afraid I don't have much better news to give you. From 2014 to 2018, we have seen just a 0.6% of decline in the carbon intensity of the global energy system, that is the amount of carbon per unit of energy generated. At this pace, it would take us 150 years to fully decarbonize our energy system. I don't need to highlight that that is very incompatible with the goals of the, climate, of the Paris Agreement. And if we look at what's happening in different HDI groups, the very high HDI group, the group of countries with very high human development index, are starting to decarbonize um, their energy systems. Those in the high HDI groups perhaps are starting to, but by and large have increased the carbon intensity of their systems. So have countries in the medium HDI group. The low HDI group with low levels of um, industrial activity, low levels of economic activity, is still having a very low level of carbon intensity. And we're not talking about energy and carbon intensity alone. This translates not only to climate change, but also to direct impacts on our health through, for example, air pollution that comes from the burning of, the, of these fossil fuels. And looking at air pollution, in 2019, we saw over 3 million deaths that could be attribute, attributed to anthropogenic PM2.5 pollution, that pollution, particulate matter pollution, that is the most harmful to our health. A third of those deaths, about a million of those deaths, were related to fossil fuel combustion directly. And again, when we look at the deaths per 100,000 per 100, inhabitants, I wanted to look here again at the Human Development Index stratification that we've done. The countries with the medium and high Human Development Index are the ones that have the most impact of uh, air pollution on the health of their inhabitants. The very high Human Development Index group with better regulations and with a rapid decarbonization of their uh, energy system is seeing lower levels of um, air pollution related death. So this also exposes an, in an, an inequity in terms of the co-benefits of that rapid decarbonization. These 3.3 million deaths would be avoidable if we transition towards a low carbon um, system. However, in order to do so, we have to ensure that we are capturing in the price, in the economic uh, price of our of fossil fuels and carbon emissions, the full cost of those emissions to the environment, but particularly 
to human health, to our social determinants of health and to our economies. However, and again, I don't have very good news for you. We looked at 84 countries and how they were pricing fossil fuels. 77% of those 84 countries still had a net negative carbon price in 2018. What this means is that we take into account all of the carbon subsidies and all of the carbon taxes. And all in all, if we add them all together per country, we're see seeing that 77% of countries are still financing the burning of fossil fuels that harms our health using public funds to do so. What is even perhaps more outrageous is that when we look at the amount of money that countries are putting towards subsidizing fossil fuels as a proportion of their health budgets, that is what this graph is showing you, we see that many countries are putting amounts to subsidize fossil fuels that are even higher than the budget that they allocate to health. More than 100% of the budget that they allocate to health is going towards subsidizing health harming fossil fuels. Very few countries today have a net tax, are putting a carbon price on fossil fuels that would reflect a, a bit more of their actual costs to society and to our health. If we want to transition towards a low carbon economy, we need to capture the full health cost of fossil fuel burning. However, after all of these dire messages and not very hopeful messages, I, I, I do realize, I should tell you that there is still hope. We have seen a very fast unrolling of renewable um, electricity generation, of renewable sources of energy. Between 2013 and 2018, the renewable energy generation incre increased on average by 17%. This is an enormous increase. Today, we have reached 7.2% of the global share of electricity being generated from renewables. We're also seeing that more and more jobs are being created in the low carbon industry and that each time the fossil fuel industry starts reducing. And this is really positive, firstly, because um, jobs in the, in the uh, low carbon industry in general are healthier, they're not so exposed, but also because it's a sustainable um, uh, source of income. We won't be able to have jobs in a fossil fuel industry in the next years. So people are getting trained, people are having jobs, and we're expanding the size of the labor force uh, in a low carbon uh, economy. And finally, we track through our indicator, governmental engagement on health and climate change, particularly how governments see climate change as a health issue. And in order to do so, we look at to which extent countries mention climate change and health in their UN general debates. In the UN general debates, countries exposed to the world, what are their priorities? In 2020, we've seen that 47% of countries did mentions to health and climate change in their UN general debate speech. This is almost twice the amount of the year before. So we are seeing increased engagement in these two topics, probably driven by and large by the COVID pandemic, that is true, but COVID at least has exposed how essential our health is and to which extent our systems can be disrupted when we have big uh, threats to our health. Now, as the world tries to recover from the COVID pandemic, we're seeing almost $2 trillion directed towards COVID recovery. Current plans show that only about 18% of those um, 2 trillion as of the end of 2020, were expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have a panel in the report that says this. So the overall impact today of COVID recovery plans would be negative. It will throw us completely off track to meet the Paris Agreement goals. It is not aligned with the national determined contributions or the commitments under the Paris Agreement. However, we were not expecting to all of a sudden have $2 trillion to reactivate and rebuild our economies. So COVID recovery also is a big opportunity for a better future. If governments really commit to using those $2 trillion to rebuild in a sustainable way, a sustainable economy that protects our health and reduces inequities, abiding by the WHO's prescriptions for a green recovery and a healthy recovery from COVID-19, we can really ensure a better future for all. However, this will only be possible if the leaders of the world commit to urgent action and we all act together to ensure that no one is left behind. 
in the upcoming COP26, we have a unique opportunity where COVID recovery, the use of these funds, and um, the, the, the COP26 ambitions unite. And it's a crucial moment for um, the world leaders to commit to a better future for all. With that, I will finish. I just wanted to point you towards um, our data platform where you can look at our indicators in a bit more detail, looking at countries in particular. We have very uh, geographically disaggregated indicators and many, many thanks um, to Jamie Pon uh, Ponmatam and Katia Konasolis for helping build this. And with that, I will hand over to Anthony again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. I mean, a lot of bad news, some good news towards the end, but I think all of you listening should download this report, uh, make it your bedside reading, because do a little bit at a time, because Marina's only presented about 15, 20% of all the indicators. There's a lot of text in there. And do share the findings or the policy briefs with your local MPs, with your local people and talk about it because many of you are teachers and very influential and we want you to spread the word because this is a health crisis. This is not just an environmental or economic crisis, important though that is as well. Um, and I, on the last slide, we refer to the Wellcome Trust. I must say that the Wellcome Trust have funded this work and Madeline Thompson and her team have been really supportive to us. And we are very grateful because without them, none of this would have been possible. Now I'd like to move on to some of our regional uh, contributors and authors. We're gonna have four. Uh, our first person, since the very beginning, when we did our first commission back in 2009, we've had a very close relationship with Xinhua University in China. Uh, first with Professor Peng Gong, who is one of our co-chairs and is, uh, has moved actually to become uh, vice uh, chancellor or vice provost, vice president of Hong Kong University, but his colleague, Professor Wenjia Kai, uh, she is a, a professor for earth science at Tsinghua University in China. And she's also the director of the Lancet Countdown in Asia. And she's now gonna tell us a little bit about the China experience. Hello, friends and colleagues. This is Wenjia Tai. It's really nice to meet all of you virtually in this global launch event. Our Asia Center is based in the Department of Earth System Science in Tsinghua University in Beijing. Professor Peng Gong, who is now the Vice Chancellor of Hong Kong University, is our advisor. Last year, we have published the first China Lancet Countdown Report in the Lancet Public Health. With the support from 19 institutions and 77 experts, we plan to update our report every year with provincial level details. Since last year, we have held a series of activities with different stakeholders. With policymakers, we have held two policymakers face-to-face -face dialogue with them to update them about the findings uh, in the annual report as well as the uh, findings in the most recent uh, literatures. With media, we have tried our best to maintain a good relationship with the more than 40 media agencies who attended our launch event last year by answering their queries for their interviews. And with authors and collaborators, we have also organized working groups meetings. And this year, Dr. Margaret Chen, who was the former Director General for WHO, have joined our authorship for the 2021 report. If I have to make, name three milestones for the last year, I would say the following three items would be my choice. The first one is after inviting the delegates from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment to join our policymakers dialogue, they have invited us to participate in the drafting of the health chapter of China's climate change adaptation strategy 2035 which will be the main guiding document for China's adaptation actions in the following 15 years. The second one is 
Although the policymakers from the National Health Commission couldn't make it to our launch event last year, we have successfully presented findings to the high-level policymakers in this commission this year, and they all commented that the climate health interlinkages should be thought more highly in their future policymaking process. And the third one is. With the support from the Lancet editorial office, we have successfully launched a special issue named "Projecting the Health Climate Change Impact on Human Health in China." The papers in this special issue will be very different from the previous ones because we will be using the same climate and population scenarios in these papers, so that the results would be comparable and could be easily understood and used by policymakers in China. We are、uh, also thinking about expanding to other regions in Asia. So, if you are interested, please feel free to contact me. And finally, on behalf of the 25 institutions and 88 co-authors for the 2021 report, I would warmly,、uh, I would warmly welcome you to join the launch event in Asia on November the 8th. You will be easily find the. Uh, the the links to join our event in the Global Lens Countdown website. Thank you very much. Wenjia, thank you very much indeed. And it's、um, certainly true. Sir David King was on the television last night saying that、um, he'd always found the Chinese very receptive. I, I mean, they're a huge country. They have the highest emissions in the world, and they're trying to make a transition out of coal, and they're facing all the fuel price problems that we have at the moment.、Uh, but there is a real commitment there to move towards renewables, and certainly Peng Gong and Wen Jia have been extremely、uh, active at a high level in getting across the health impacts to the Chinese policymakers. I'm going to move on now to Europe and introduce you to Professor Rachel Low, who is the new. Director of the uh,、um, Lancet Countdown in Europe,、um, she has been based at the London School of Hygiene for several years as an associate professor. She's a mathematical modeler, epidemiologist, but、uh, in January she's moving to be professor and director of the Global Re Health Resilience Team、um, in the Earth Sciences Department in Barcelona in、um, IS Global. There,、uh, so over to you, Rachel. And let's hear about some work in Europe. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you for the introduction.、Um, and yeah, I'm currently based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and in January I'm moving to the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre、uh, to start the Global Health Resilience、um, Group and also、uh, lead the centre, the new centre for the Lancet Countdown in Europe. So I'm delighted to be、uh, taking this new role.、Um, next slide, please. So、uh, the Lancet Countdown in Europe has、uh, recently been launched, and it's a transdisciplinary collaboration、um, that is set to track progress on health and climate change in the European region. Next slide, please. So it's the latest member of the Lancet Countdown family, and we'll be, we will be working alongside and in close collaboration with the Lancet Countdown in Asia, South America, Australia, and small island developing states. So, as one of the largest、uh, current and historical emitters of greenhouse gases, and the largest provider of、uh, financing for climate change mitigation and adaptation, Europe's response is crucial for both human health and the health of the planet. And to ensure that health and well-being are protected in this response, it's essential to build the capacity to understand, monitor, and quantify the health impacts of climate change and the health co-benefits of accelerated action. So, with the wealth of data and academic expertise available in Europe, the collaboration will develop region-specific and policy-relevant indicators to address the main challenges and opportunities of Europe's response to climate change for health. The indicators produced by the collaboration will also contribute to the new European Climate and Health Observatory. Next slide, please. So, please meet our expanding team.、Uh, on the management team, I'm joined by our chairs Maria Nilsson and Josette Marie Anton. 
as well as our Europe consultant Kim Van Dern and uh, Marina Romaneo, uh, Research Director of the Lancet, um, the Global Lancet Countdown, who we just heard from. Um, and the indicators that are being developed under the five working groups, which mirrors the structure of the global report, looking at impacts, adaptation, mitigation, economics and social and political engagement, are led by experts working in these fields, including Joaquin Ruklov, Jan Semenza, Catherine Tonner, Slava Jankin and Nahir Dasandi. And we're also joined by our WHO Europe observers, Oliver Schmoll and Vladimir Kondrovsky. We are currently building the working groups for each theme and we welcome researchers from around Europe who think they can contribute evidence-based and policy relevant indicators for this report to join the collaboration. Next slide please. We published our first report outlining the framework for the initiative in the Lancet Public Health last month detailing the kinds of indicators we will be developing to address the main challenges and opportunities of Europe's response to climate change for health, leveraging the, the high quality of data available in European countries. And you can visit um, the website www.lancetcountdown.org forward slash Europe to contribute to this initiative. Next slide, please. So alongside this year's global report, a policy brief for Europe went live today. And across a backdrop of the upcoming COP26 and the COVID-19 recovery, this brief focuses on data and policy recommendations on heat health in Europe, urban green space, and energy systems and air pollution and health. So the key recommendations of the report include protecting health from heat waves with appropriate adaptation strategies and heat health action plans, enhancing city level adaptation and mitigation for intelligent urbanization and increasing urban green spaces to promote mental and physical health, aligning EU and WHO air quality standards in a legally binding manner, and co-developing policies to tackle the source of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. And the policy brief will officially launch on the 3rd of December. So watch this space and follow Kim Van Dalen on Twitter for updates. Next slide, please. So to finish, it's a pleasure and an honor to be leading this important initiative with such a wonderful team. And please do contact us if you think you can contribute policy relevant indicators to track progress on health and climate change in Europe. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. And I, I think it, what, what we're emerging is the power of devolution and also of networks of scientists. I mean, scientists always have lively discussions, but there is a tremendous will to collaborate. And we're also going to link with our regional hubs into the local political structures like the EU or ASEAN or wherever. Uh, uh, and also into the regional offices of the World Health Organization and other UN bodies. So uh, we're providing a resource for that. And thank you very much uh, for that. Actually, I discovered when you pronounced Marina's name that I've been working with her for two years and calling her name wrong. So she's not Marina Romanello. She's R Marina Romaneo. So I'll practice my Spanish. OK, next we're moving on to Dr. Stella Hartinger who is uh, another fantastic leader and networker. She is an assistant professor at Caetano Heredia University in Peru, and she's co-director of a center called CLIMA, the Center for Latin American Research on Climate Change and Health, and she's the director now of the Lancet Countdown in South America. So we're gonna hear from, from Stella, over to you. Hi, from the city of Lima, Peru. My name is Stella Hartinger and I am leading the Lancet Countdown South America initiative. I am sorry that I cannot join you in person, but I will try to quickly summarize who we are and what our region faces concerning climate change and health. First, I am thrilled to be part of the Lancet Countdown six annual report launch. This is the second year that the Lancet Countdown South America supports the initiative with academic institutions from different countries. 
Our regional center was created to coordinate collaboration between academic institutions and contribute to the global and regional indicators, participate in global reports, policy briefs, case studies, and expand country level communication in our region. South America has historically been underrepresented in global reports with insufficient data on climate change and its impacts on health. This has led to information and data gaps that have limited our ability to act and make informed decisions about adaptation and mitigation plans in our region. We're a specifically vulnerable region to the effects of climate change, even though we are not a significant contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. As you may know, our region is very heterogeneous in climate, ecosystems, human population, and culture. The Lancet Counter reports how shows how underprepared we are to face the health effects of climate change. However, we share similar vulnerabilities. According to the new IPCC report, the different sectors that will be most affected are water, water resources due to tropical glacial loss in the Andes and deforestation, ecosystem changes driven by land use and cover and land cover changes that will also lead to forest fragmentations and degradations, increasing vulnerability to forest fires, and human health, which will diminish uh, health outcomes, increase mortality, and exacerbate health inequalities. Because of this, we need to ensure that all people, no matter the ethnic group they belong to, have access to the same standards of care. Thus, each country's adaptation plans must be tailored to guarantee quality access to care and create a climate resilient healthcare system. For this year launch, we have developed four policy briefs with original partners. In each one, we discuss relevant topics for its country's policymakers using the Lancet countdown data. For, from all the South American countries, Brazil is the source of a significant share of the total global greenhouse gas emissions. However, the Brazilian government does not realize the urgency of, of climate change action needed. The Chile policy brief highlights the increasing vulnerability of the Chilean population to heat waves, greater exposure to wildfires, and air pollution. These topics reflect on how populations' well beings and health are determined by factors and policies that go beyond the health, health sector, recognizing the crucial role of housing, energy, urban planning, agriculture, and economic sectors. The Peruvian policy brief touches upon the impact of temperature, glacier loss, and adaptation plans. As a lesson from COVID 19 pandemic and a step towards preparedness, it flags the importance of ensuring adequate quality of care for the entire population. Finally, the Costa Rica policy brief focuses on gender and inequities in vulnerable populations, uh, flagging the need of a territorial approach to community health risk, which makes possible to respond to the population's specific needs. I just want to finish by saying that we have created a wonderful group of people committed to being part of the Lancet Countdown family. Please follow us in our specific country launches in Peru, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, and Costa Rica. You will find more information on the Lancet Countdown website. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Stella. And um, uh, I happen to know that she's built a network of more than 60 academics. It may be more than that now, but um, it, it just shows the power of networking. And of course, those academics can be very influential in chatting with students, with uh, fellow professionals, with policymakers and the like. Our final uh, contributor from a region's uh, is really important because we've got Professor Georgiana Gordon Strachan. She's director of the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit at the University of the West Indies. And she's also the director of our Lancet Countdown Group on Small Island Developing States, who are in the front line of climate change because their very existence is threatened. Many islands in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Islands and elsewhere. So um, over to you, Georgiana. Hello, everyone. And I'm sorry that you can't see me. However, I'm so happy to be here and delighted to present at this, at this launch of the 2021 Lancet Countdown Commission on Climate Change and Health. So just to give a bit of context, next slide, please. The small island developing states are about 65 million of the world's population. We're about 52 small islands, and we contribute less than 1% for some estimates and 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. 
However, as you are all aware, I'm sure, we are among the most vulnerable to climate change. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our vulnerability lies, and I'm only pulling three things here, in the fact that most of our infrastructure and human settlements are concentrated around coastal zones, which, with sea level rise being unabated, would have devastating effects on our economic activities and our livelihoods. We also are, some of us are low-lying atoll islands, and this may render us uninhabitable and maybe non-existent. In terms of extreme events, we are geographically located in areas prone to extreme weather, such as cyclones or hurricanes, storm surges, tsunamis, and volcanoes. And the changing weather patterns in terms of heats, extreme heat and droughts and episodic rainfall affect our water and food insecurity. Next slide, please. So the Lancet, recognizing these issues, had the good sense to think about initiating and establishing a regional center for small island developing states. The goal of which is to bring together institutions in the Caribbean Sea, as well as institutions in the SIT's specific region and within the region spanning AIMS. And AIMS includes Atlantic and Indian Ocean Islands, Mediterranean and South China Sea Islands, and bringing them together on key issues which relate to health and climate change in small island developing states. Next, please. So we started this initiative by doing a scoping exercise to try to identify what were these priority areas for research and action. Next slide, please. The priority areas identified during our scoping exercise were vector-borne diseases, dengue fever in particular, air quality, chronic non-communicable diseases. Next slide, please. Capacity building and special mention of education and infusing climate change and health into school curricula. And of course, ocean health. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So out of this, we developed uh, three scopes of work, three main areas. And the first is to develop a network of academic and research institutions within the three SIDS regions, which I mentioned earlier. And this is to support the Lancet Countdown SIDS research and communication efforts. Next slide, please. The second scope looks at producing locally led research on the relationships between health and climate change that are of particular importance to SIDS communities within the SIDS communities themselves and across the regions. Next slide, please. And of course, to use this research and these additional data and new indicators which will come and emanate from this, this work to inform the Lancet Countdown's Global Annual Indicator Report. Next slide, please. So where are we now? We, in June, we launched the Lancet Scoping Report and we had great participation, especially from Caribbean stakeholders in climate change. We presented the findings at the Caribbean Public Health Agency's 66th annual conference and got good feedback on other areas that we need to focus on. We have started the creation of a database of researchers from SIDS universities to form a network of climate change and health for SIDS. And right now, I'm very happy to say that we're in the final stages of contract negotiation for the establishment of the regional center. We hope to launch before COP26. On a personal note, I would like to congratulate the Lancet Commission on this important milestone. I'm very excited to see where we've come from and especially where else and how far we have to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgiana, and thank you for your work, because I know how much time you've put into building this network. 
in fact the explosion in our networks has kind of slightly overwhelmed us and and uh, I, I would just like to say that at the moment we've been dependent upon the Wellcome Trust our hubs and ourselves will want to diversify our funding resources so if any of you listening have connections with foundations that you think could help this crucially important work not just for research but to get research into policy and practice so that we can adapt and mitigate this this climate crisis if you know of foundations or even high net worth individuals who would like to support this work then please do get in touch either with our regional present uh, representatives or indeed with us because we would be delighted to uh, take your money from you um okay next uh oh we're moving on to the panel discussion now um and we have a great group of people actually who are going to join us now i i think that we're going to have to set up the panel there might be 30 seconds that enable you to have a comfort break or get a glass of water but viola are we uh going into oh yes i can see some fellow panelists um fantastic uh, a real bunch of troublemakers. So we've got, um, uh, I don't think I'll, I'm going to introduce you as I come to you, all right? And uh, wh what we're talking about now, and we're go I'm going to ask a few questions, but I hope if you can put questions into the comments, then I will try and get some of those uh, to be covered over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So um, climate change, climate change and health, the whole problem of inequities, the widening gap between those that contribute the least to admission to emissions, as in many low income countries, but they suffer the effects the most. And then, of course, the challenge for those who contribute the most to emissions uh, and can afford to mitigate and adapt and how we're going to do that uh, with the private sector, with the public sector. Uh, uh, with market responses, with government investment and the like. So there are big issues to talk about. Um, I'm going to kick off with Liz, Liz Robinson. Um, Liz is director, the new director, in fact, of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics, a very prestigious uh, post. And she's also been a Lancet Countdown author for several years, and she leads the working group on climate change impacts, exposures and vulnerabilities. So, Liz, the, the Countdown report has shown the, you know, the kind of levels of exposure of um, populations to heat waves, especially young infants and over 65s being most vulnerable. And it has increased very sharply in... Uh, you know, 2020 compared to just 15 years ago. So in your experience, what, what impact is heat stress and heat waves having on populations? And then we'll come on to what we can do about it. Um, thank you, Anthony. So I think this very much builds on the um, excellent presentation Marina gave us at the beginning. And uh, heat and heat waves perhaps is one of the areas where we can see the most direct links between uh, climate change and health. And we know that exposure to extreme heat poses an acute health hazard. And it particularly, um, it puts a lot of pressure on our bodies, on our cardiovascular systems. It particularly affects um, individuals over, say, over 65, very young children, populations in urban areas due to what's termed the urban heat effect, that towns tend to be warmer than, than their surroundings, and people with um, pre-existing health conditions. It also affects people who are marginalized and under-resourced more. And if we think about it, in some ways, those are the very people who have been particularly harmed by COVID. And I think that that suggests that we have a particular obligation um, to rapidly transition to low carbon resilient economies for that reason. And I think perhaps surprisingly, this makes um, populations in higher income countries where we have older people, more urbanized people, people with pre-existing conditions, particularly and increasingly vulnerable to the direct impacts of heat. In low income countries, our report shows that agricultural workers in particular, a key group that are at risk of heat and heat waves associated with climate change. And these people may not be able to adapt their working conditions or their working hours to avoid the hottest parts of the day. So they're choosing either to compromise their health, compromise their harvests or compromise their income, which is going to compromise their food security and their health in another way. Um, there's been very recent evidence, I was just reading, that increasing temperatures are leading to increasing kidney disease in outdoor workers more broadly, and particularly in hotter countries. 
And also there's what we might think about sort of subtler impacts of heat that we've started to track in the Lancet countdown. And just this year, we've been tracking um, the extent to which there are fewer hours when we can safely exercise outdoors. That's particularly problematic in low income countries. We're also for the first time tracking um, sentiments of well-being to try and get some sense of our mental well-being. And we're finding that during heat waves, there's fewer positive expressions and more negative expressions. So that's just some of those um, impacts we're finding. And before I stop talking, I've just noticed some people might still be muted. Um, I think on Mars, you might be muted. So I'm just going to say that now and then pass on to Anthony. Thanks. I, I mean, just to follow up, one thing is, you know, everyone talks about resilience and you know in my trips to you know much warmer countries than the UK like India uh, Bangladesh southern Africa and the like um, you know a lot of people adapt fairly naturally with darkened rooms keeping cool parts of the house having trees and places outside to provide shade and all the kinds of things that you can do in a very warm climate. But from an economic point of view, how are we going to invest in resilience? Uh, so certainly we need to invest rapidly in resilience. And what I would say is um, about, I think it's 11 years ago now, uh, higher income countries um, pledged to commit $100 billion a year towards helping low income countries transition to low carbon resilient societies. And we're really grateful that we still haven't reached that. So sustainable finance is just one of those critical areas. And in fact, we need to increase those pledges. Uh, we need the finance to be available. And, and, and if we think about it, in higher income countries, we've reduced our emissions and we've increased our prosperity. And in doing that, we're actually enjoying better health because we have lower air pollution and we have, um, you know, we're starting to invest better in sort of public transportation and we're focusing on sort of healthy, balanced diets. And it does seem a little bit unfair that people in lower income countries are suffering from these um, really atrocious sort of air quality, whether it's outdoor air quality from electricity generated by coal, whether it's from um, farmers who can who, who have no alternative really than to burn the stubble after they've harvested, whether it's people who have no alternatives for cooking other than solid fuel and they're cooking indoors and the particulate matter is harming their lungs. So um, higher income countries have pledged and we need to just sort of strengthen those pledges even more, find that money to finance that just transition that we really need to allow people in low income countries to enjoy increased prosperity and better health that we've enjoyed from actually reducing our emissions. We need to do better in higher income countries. We need to support low income countries too. Do you think at COP26 we'll achieve the 100 billion pounds a year, sorry, 100 billion dollars a year commitment to provide support to poorer countries? I'm a born optimist, so I'm going to say yes, we're very close and we know how important it is and we know that we have a moral obligation to. So I'm going to say yes as an optimist. All right, thanks very much. I'm going to come to Almaz. Almaz, you're a student. You're actually a school person from South Africa. And I think, actually, I should have asked you because you may have, the last time we spoke, you were 14, but are you 15 now? Yes, I just turned 15. Oh, lovely. Um, look, every age group and every region is being affected by uh, climate change. But, you know, the, the threat to you is, in a sense, much greater than to me at my advanced age, which I won't say. Um, and, you know, basically what I, I'd like to get you've done something really interesting because you and your friends and uh, across the country, school and children and young people have come up with a climate action plan that you've released for the South African authorities. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, thank you, Professor Costello. Young people from all over South Africa have debated and collaborated to craft South Africa's first ever youth <coughs> climate action plan, which we call the SAY CAP. Our goal is that the SAY CAP will serve as a framework to inspire youth-led action and further serve as a guide for youth, civil society, business and government to reshape our country into a climate just and resilient society. Our recommendations are guided by our experiences living in an unequal and unsustainable world, but led by our vision of what a reshaped future can be. We have written clear actions that are required for our vision to become a reality. 
To solve climate change, we need a culture change. I hope global leaders can learn from what the youth are already doing in South Africa. Our first port of call was to organize ourselves in functioning groups, such as media leads, provincial leads, and high school leads. I'm one of the high school leads for the YCAP. We then needed to mobilize ourselves. The youth in South Africa are privileged to have organizations like Youth at Sire, who brought us together, nurtured us, and supported us through this process. We need more organizations like this. The coordinating team for the YCAP also had to innovate to complete this initiative under COVID circumstances. <coughs> the Sire had to provide young people with data grants to combat the digital divide. We had to be thrifty when creating advertisements to balance a small budget for a huge project. The youth of South Africa could not be climate leaders if they did not understand climate change. The media shapes national narratives. So our media leads provided simple, accessible information online. But we struggled to get the YCAP in mainstream media. COVID has shown us how important social media is. Yeah. I hope we can now start using it for good. As I mentioned, I'm one of three high school liaisons for the SAY Cup. It was my job to coordinate the high schools of South Africa and include their opinions in the YCAP. I ran a virtual climate change roadshow for students across South Africa to learn and contribute to the climate change agenda. There were two main events that stood out for me. Our National Youth Model Parliament on Climate Change and our National Climate Change Stories Open Mic. The Youth Model Parliament debate brought over 100 young people across South Africa representing their communities to debate their climate change suggestions because a one size fits all strategy will never solve climate change. The YCAP seeks to be inclusive and diverse in opinion. The open mic compiles stories and lived experiences of the youth. Not all people are able to express themselves in the traditional academic style. Therefore, the YCAP coordinators included other forms of media, such as stories and art for input into the YCAP. So in summary, I would like to point out that the SA YCAP was completed on a shoestring budget, and it was a major step for youth advocacy and climate action in South Africa. I cannot imagine what we could have done if we had a larger budget. The youth have ideas. We just need support resource sharing and collaboration intergenerationally. All people need to become environmentally sustainable to solve climate change. So we cannot exclude anyone's voices. The youth want to be included in decision-making spaces and want all communities to be equally represented too. The youth want to be included and uh, in decision-making spaces. Um, decisions made today will heavily affect our future. The YCAP is a testament to what the youth can contribute if we are not left out. It is easy to solve climate change, but to sustain climate change gains, we need to ensure a deep understanding of the intersectionality of climate change. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Almaz. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I mean, um, a lot of people see school children as very uh good at running strikes and uh adding their voice to very powerful advocacy and that has been extremely important i think that is important but how can we where, if you were giving advice to people listening today about one or two tips about how you might harness the creativity and enthusiasm of young people into very positive engagement as well as the kind of advocacy stuff what areas would you recommend moving into i think the climate change right now um i'm of the opinion that we have the signs that we need to start solving climate change what we need right now is to actually go and take action i yeah. think the youth we do have ideas what we need is funding to try and support these ideas I know with the YCAP, we found it extremely difficult to get the, the YCAP into mainstream media when we were actually creating the document so that all youth could know about the YCAP and try to contribute. So I think we need to foster that intergenerational collaboration. 
so that adults can help us with advertising our initiatives, maybe even improving on it by offering their expertise. And more so, I would say funds, because as youth, um, even on the YCAP, we've been working on a shoestring budget. And I think the big businesses, they have so much more money just to make one advertisement. So I think if we just had a fraction of that money, the YCAP could have been so much bigger. Great. So, lob so in other words, lobby local companies as well to uh, make them give some of their profits into local initiatives in which adolescents can be created. That's interesting because um, at UCL, we've got a, a, a program working with WHO and UNICEF on a thing called Children in All Policies. And we're exploring working with adolescents, young people using citizen science with mobile phones to collect a lot of information about their local ecosystems, their local environment in ways to build resilience. So it might be floods, flooding risks in Pacific islands or landslides in Nepal or, or wherever. And I think these are issues that need to be evaluated and also expanded at some scale. But I'm going to, I'm, thanks, we'll come back Almaz, don't worry, we've got time. Um, I'd like to go to Sunita, Sunita Dr. Sunita Narayan, is uh has been the director general at the center for science and environment in delhi india since 1982. she's a leading writer and environmentalist who as i've discovered over the years is unafraid to express her views so um my question sunita look india will soon have the world's largest population we know that its economy ha has shown pretty impressive growth You've got a huge number of dynamic young people to modernize your economy. But, you know, you're one of the leading environmentalists in the country. You're well aware that they face many environmental threats to the future, uh, both of the economy and the environment. And you're very dependent on coal. What do you see as the biggest short term and medium term environmental threats to India? And my second question, which you can run into, is if you were Prime Minister of India, what would be your priorities for action in the next decade? So, Anthony, you know, for India, the issue is obviously more about local air pollution. And uh, when you look at coal, uh, the question for us is the toxicity uh, of coal and the impact on our lungs. I mean, we, I heard that uh, very clearly from earlier speakers as well, and that's what concerns us. So for us, the coal issue, and I think that's slightly different from the way it is portrayed, particularly in the Western media, um, the coal issue for India is about local air pollution. And for us, the climate change challenge is about framing it within what I would call a co-benefit approach. I mean, if you look at any data, Anthony, and I think this is where the inequity of climate change has to be understood, and it is very stark. The fact is, India may be the world's third or the fourth largest polluter, but in sheer volume, it is minuscule. Our government has no right to sit on the high table of polluters. We may want to, but we do not have the right. That right belongs to your country, Anthony, and it belongs now to, say, China. It's 10 gigatons versus a minuscule uh, uh, two and a half, three gigatons of India annually. So the, the difference is massive. And India has a major challenge of development and energy security. Now, this is where when we get to COP26 and we get to the fact that a country like India is a victim of climate change. We are seeing the impacts of climate change every day. We see the floods and uh, horrendous floods which have killed 50 people yesterday in the northern state of Uttarakhand. Kerala has had landslides, un untimely rain, extreme rain events, destroying crippling local economies. There is no doubt climate change is here for us. We don't need to be preached the idea of climate change and the need to, to reinvent, to rework. Now, this is where the tragedy of, of our times is. I mean, I was, I, I'm old enough to say that I was in Rio in 1992. 
And in Rio in 1992, I thought we came up with a framework which said that we have a problem of climate change, which will come up at that time in the future. And therefore, the answer is that the rich must reduce so the poor can grow. And for the poor to grow differently, we would have money and technology. There was a framing of the agreement. Now, the rich have not reduced. And I, I disagree with, the, uh, with my fellow panelists on this. I mean, let's be very clear. The scale of the reduction that was needed by the seven largest polluters has not happened. If you look at their share of the carbon budget, it has been appropriated. It has been colonized by a few countries and the rest have crumbs today. Now, this is where the reality is. We have a country like India. It has over a billion people. Large numbers of people do not have access to energy. Are you essentially saying now that the carbon budget is over and therefore you have no right to grow? Are we saying that this billion people need to just go home and never get up tomorrow, never breathe because, they, because the world has run out of the carbon budget? I mean, that's the crisis today that COP26 must confront. It must not spend more time and waste more time in trying to erase the, the principle of historical responsibility or injustice. It must take it headlong and say, what do we do? And to do this, we need that funding to be transformational. Definitely large numbers of people in India must move out of coal. Definitely we must move out of burning uh, biomass in dirty um, <coughs> cook stoves. These are opportunities for us to be building our homes differently, to do thermal comfort in a way that we can go back to the past. You talked about this, Anthony, because you know India very well. You talked about this. And, you know, ultimately it's about how many men, how many suits and ties are we going to wear? Or are we going to dress appropriately when you have climate change? I mean, that's, that's the heat factor that we have lived with in my country, mm -hmm. where we have dressed for the heat. We have built for the heat. We have courtyards in our houses because that's the best way to funnel the, the wind through our houses. So there is an enormous wealth of understanding that we could mm -hmm. bring back. But the fact is it will cost. The fact is that instead of finger pointing on countries like India and saying, oh, but you're going to use coal and look at the number of Indian middle class and look at the middle, look at their use of cellular phones and mobile phones and air conditioners. I mean, let's get real. This is about sharing. This is the first time the world is understanding. It lives in an interdependent world and it's about sharing not just the wealth, but also the planetary space, the limited planetary space we have. And this is the first time we better get our act together to say we cannot wish away the need to be able to share and to be able to build a new world based on equity and justice. And the prime minister question I'm not getting into. I'll never be prime minister, Anthony, thankfully. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Oh, um, I know. <laughs> can I just push you a little bit on the, I yes. mean, I, I, everything I hear is correct. The historical uh, deficit that India has suffered by being colonialized by us. I mean, basically from that's, taking all that's your... In the past. That's, no, that's another issue. Yeah, but it's important yeah. because you, you haven't used the levels of coal and fossil fuels that we have over 150 years to build our development. And so your, your argument is a very potent one and a common one from all low income or middle income countries that are emerging. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you about renewables? Because it seems strange to me at the moment, fossil fuels are very expensive right now. Prices are shooting up. Renewables are actually falling all their prices. And the one thing that India and South Asia has is a lot of sunshine, uh, some hydropower stuff. Um, you know, they can, they've got wind. Um, I, I, 36 years ago, when I lived in Nepal for a couple of years, I always remember taking a tiny little solar thing out, which charged up during the day to uh, renewable batteries. And that kept me on the radio for the whole 24 hours. 
And in those days, that was fantastic. I could listen to the, you know, world service or whatever. But, you know, solar's improved. It's got it. Do you see uh, India becoming a world leader in renewables because they can both innovate and manufacture and also use as a huge domestic market? No, no question about it, Anthony. And as I said, for us as environmentalists, we need to move out of dirty fuel. We need to make sure that we can uh, move out of whether it's diesel, dirty diesel, or whether it is coal for local air pollution. And, you know, renewables are clearly the way ahead. Renewables, they and they're powering a different mobility system, one that moves people and not vehicles. One, you know, there, there's huge opportunities of being able to use renewables also for energy access. And, 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 and Anthony, let's be clear, the Indian government has a very ambitious plan. We have talked about a 450 gigawatt plan. China actually has a, a plan of 1200 gigawatts. And China today is, uh, if you look at non-fossil fuel energy uh, generation, China's lower than India, even though it uses such massive volumes. Now, so I think it's important to get this, this picture right that yes, we need to do this and we are working on it. But Anthony, let me just dispel one illusion that you have. Solar is not cheaper, okay? Let's be very clear about that. When I hear this idea about solar being cheaper, cheaper to fossil fuel, and yes, you know, gas prices have gone up, which is why your country has started your coal-based power plants again. So let's be very clear about the reality of the world today. Uh, when we are being preached to about coal and UK starts as coal-based power plants, we need to understand that that's, that's the reality of the world, okay? But the fact is, Solar and solar, um, the, the generation per unit of solar is only 20% as against coal, which is 50 to 60%, per, 50% to 55%. So if you look at it apples to apples in terms of the cost per unit of generation, it's not that much cheaper. And the fact is that we have poor people, and you know this, Anthony, I don't have to say this, but your audience knows it as well. We have people who cannot even afford the cheapest energy source today. So for yeah. me, the biggest opportunity we have is to build mini grids to get energy into the homes of the poorest. But yeah. that will require money to subsidize every unit of energy to say it is your right to have energy and we will give you clean energy rather than dirty energy. So those are the opportunities that they are. But that requires an ability to think big and to be big. Today, we are seeing a mean and an extremely insecure world, which is literally dog eat dog world. And that's what needs to change at COP. 26. Thank you. I mean, we'll come back to that. You don't sound terribly optimistic about COP26, but that, never mind. We'll come back to some of the wins that we hope could be achieved there. I want to move to Dermot. Dermot campbell Endrum is uh, the head at the World Health Organization of the um, Climate Change Unit and has been a co-author on our Lancet Countdown reports for several years and as sits as our international advisor and we greatly appreciate that um well first i should say you've been cycling from geneva to london to glasgow uh because you're going to deliver a report to uh the cop 26 and why are you doing such a crazy thing as this it's called right to life isn't it thanks, tell us thanks, thanks very much anthony can i just check you can hear me first um I mean, I, yeah, I, we can hear you. Fantastic, thank you. I, my, me and my phone have just got a bit damp over the last couple of hours uh, on the ride. Yeah, no, it's a very good question about why I'm doing it. Um, I do ask myself uh, that. But it's, um, so what, what it is, is that I'm basically delivering uh, WHO's report on health and climate change. That we developed in consultation with the health community. Um, we launched that last week. Um, we've had it signed by Dr. Tedros. And he's also signed a, a letter which is on behalf of, um, has been signed by um, organisations representing 45 million healthcare workers, which is calling for stronger action on climate change at COP for health, basically. The, the, the health workers of the world are saying 
We need stronger action on climate change to protect the health of populations and to get all of those health co-benefits that we've uh, that we've been hearing about. And, and just to correct you, I'm, I'm only cycling Geneva to, to London. Um, then there will that then there's a cycle f by NHS workers, particularly paediatric um, NHS workers okay. who, were, who had their own ride organised from London to Glasgow. And there is a series of art installations, of pollution pods, which are which are going along uh, with that. But I mean, the, the aim of this is, is basically that that fifth part of the, the Lancet Climate Countdown on on public engagement and social engagement, um, because the whole aim of this is, of course, to raise awareness of all of those health risks that the Lancet Climate Countdown documents uh, so well. Um, but also the other things that we've heard about from from Marina and um, and from others. Um, some of these really big messages about the really big health gains that can come, the importance, as Sunita has, has just been describing, of providing clean, renewable energy to the world's poor, because that's the solution to climate change. But that's also something that they need for their health as well. And there needs to be international solidarity on that. And part of that, that uh, awareness raising as well is to try and get the, the, the message out there, the evidence out there, um, that, in fact, we are not... Um, basically uh, subsidising renewable energy to the extent that we are subsidising fossil fuel consumption. We're, we're subsidising that either by direct financial subsidies or um, through the cost to our to our lungs. So we're taking every opportunity, including doing you know, silly things like what, what, what I'm doing, to, to get those messages out there so it becomes part of the public conversation. Because I think it is, it is pretty clear, and, and the, the evidence I think is quite clear now from around the world, there is really strong public support for action on climate change, e even in those yeah. countries which are considered the most sceptical. Most people that you ask in the street are now <laughs> concerned about climate change. They want to act on it. They want something. They want something done. And what we need to be about now is providing the the evidence, providing the solutions, showing that in the long in the long run, even in the medium, even in the medium and the short term, it's a good deal to provide clean energy to populations to have. Uh, sustainable um, transport systems, to have sustainable food systems, uh, and and so on. Um, and also, again, to, to get to that point that that Sunita is making, it's not that there's not enough money in the world to 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 do this, or we don't have the technology to do to do this. It's about how that technology is shared and how those resources are shared to address the problem that uh, that, that we all have. So that's that's the yeah that's the basis for. for, for why I'm, I'm doing the cycling and why the NHS workers are. I love the way you say you're only cycling from Geneva to London. You know, it's a mere <laughs> bag of hell. You know, I, I must say, when I worked at WHO, uh, Dermot was there, and because uh, I live 15 kilometres away, I bought myself a top of the range Swiss electric bike. And once I got to a traffic light and Dermot came up alongside me and I knew we would travel about five miles together. So I said, I, I'll show him, I'll turn it. So I turned it right up to the top power and shot off. And he was overtaking me. It was outrageous. Anyway. I was um, drafting you, uh, Anthony, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell me, I mean, cycling, we should emphasize the importance of active transport for health. Just, I mean, you've mentioned co-benefits. Just paint very quickly uh, the world of uh, the health and benefits we get. We always talk about costs of going to climate change, but what are the health and economic benefits we get from getting rid of air pollution, which is killing millions and, and destroying people's lives in all kinds of ways? And secondly, how do you see WHO's role in the whole climate change and health uh, area. What's what's your role? Do you think? Well, I, I think on the on the co-benefits question, uh, there is this headline message that that the health community, that the health evidence, can bring to the climate change discussions. That if you take into account the health gains that you will get from reaching the Paris Agreement uh, targets, if you put at the moment we're ignoring them, we're ignoring the the the, the, the impacts that air pollution has on health on people's lungs. Oh, I think we've lost Dermot temporarily. We'll come back to him. I'm going to throw open and look, we've got some great questions coming in. So how do you think the current economy, this is from Buttercup Geraldo. How do you think the current economy limits or influences 
climate change research and science, would there be conflicts of interest? That's a very good question about how universities and institutions in their search for funding often take it from less than ideal sources. I mean, I, I just read yesterday that the Science Museum in the UK is having a big exhibition and they are funded by the coal industry, which I think a lot of people have been shocked by. But anyone want to pick up on that point? Uh, sorry, Dermot, you, you fell off, but we'll come back to you in a moment. Anyone, Marina or Sunita, what about the conflicts of interest in terms of doing research or policy research and the, the kind of economic priorities and conflicts of interest? Any comments on that? Sunita. So, Anthony, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> obvious. Uh, the fact is, it's a very good question. Um, there is no doubt that the, the, the dominant industries in the world um, you know, would, would definitely like to influence uh, um, um, opinion in a way that uh, we, don't, we don't stay committed to climate change. But in my view, uh, that time is over. I mean, you know, when I, when, I, when I look back in the last 30 years, I think we lost a lot of time because uh, these industries created either the lack of information, there wasn't enough uh, public um, uh, data, and as a result of it, you know, there was always this ifs and buts, and, you know, science was so, uh, science was never so clear um, as it is today. Today, you know, quite frankly, we don't even need anybody to tell us about the reality of climate change. Yeah. It's in our face. And so I have a feeling, you know, and I, I, I really feel that as, as we get to COP26, I mean, one of the big issues for me is that COP26 and the whole process of decision making and, <clears throat> and the papers and the agenda for COP26 is somewhere still, you know, 20 years behind and, and the world and when I hear Almas and I hear the determination of young people and I see the, the, the pain and the chaos that climate change is causing in our world, not just for the poor, but also for the rich, you know, I just think that the moment has passed when anybody could, could control uh, science anymore or information anymore on climate change. I think it's it's too much out there. I think the moment now is to make sure that we can get action. And action will have to be transformational. And action is not as easy as we make it out to be. And I think that's the bottom line that we need to talk about. How do we get action at the scale we need to do it? And countries like South Africa and India, where that action has to be rooted in the benefits and the co-benefits that we get for our local economies, for poor people, energy access, and for health and for environment. That's the package that we need to talk about. Thank you. There's actually linked to that. There's, there's a very interesting question from Elvis Ndika Machiri. Um, and he says, what was the position and importance of health and youth in previous COPs and previous climate agreements uh, in comparison to today, because I get the feeling that the youth movement and also the recognition that health is a major issue, which tends to get people's attention more than polar bears. Um, is, do you think that's just illusory or do you think the, the pressure of young people is beginning to tell finally and that the health community are having a louder and more influential voice. Um, I mean, anyone can answer that, but if you want to start Sunita and perhaps Dermot. Absolutely. I think health has really become the biggest trigger for making change. I mean, I work on air pollution in Delhi and I know that it is when we got the health-based air pollution index, when we could link the amount of air pollution or the quality of air with people's health that we actually got enough more um, um, action even to close down the last coal-based power plant in Delhi. 
So I think health is important. And I think with climate change, and I think therefore the work that you do at the Lancet uh, Countdown is critical because those indicators that link climate change to people's health are the ones that are going to bring the change. So, and, and the voices of the youth, no question. I mean, I was in Rio and I can tell you in Rio, there were young people. I was young at that time as well. And I think we did make a lot of noise. But I, and I, when I think back on it, I don't think we made as strong a noise as the youth are making today. And what I love is the youth from our parts of the world, the diversity of the youth voices that I'm hearing. And those voices of diversity are not, are not just kowtowing to the sort of nice words on climate change. We are really reflecting the reality of our countries and talking truth to power and talking about the issues of poverty, marginalization, equity, and climate change. So I think there's a big difference and I really wish uh, that their voices stay loud and stay angry. Don't yeah, lose. Thank, thank you. I mean, Dermot or Liz, uh, uh, anyone wish to comment on that as well? Yeah, if, if I could just come in briefly, um, Anthony, sorry for the, the, the <coughs> dropping connection. I would agree partially with what has just been said because I do think that that we have an, an opportunity has been missed over the last 30 years I do think health should have been more prominent I mean it was in the Rio agreement it's it's article one or principle one of the Rio agreement it's the first line of the overarching Rio declaration uh, makes reference to, to health and that has been neglected and has largely partly been neglected by the health community uh, uh, over the intervening period and I do think we would probably have been in a better place if we were been talking um, about these things more in terms of health and development rather than just you know a technological fix for the problem uh, sometime down the road I do think it is changing I, I think that um, you know we see for the first time in, in the upcoming COP26 there is actually a strong health program uh, there we do see and we see that the COP presidency having a whole series of health uh, initiatives um, and we're supporting uh, uh, several of those from uh, from WHO. And we, I think we've been sort of momentarily sort of really pleased about that, that you know, health is finally there. And then just you know, thinking about it and listening to my colleagues, saying, well, yeah, it still should be a lot more than that. I mean, we've just had a global pandemic. Um, we've just seen that health can shut down economies um, uh, because of the concern about people's health. It, it is still strange to me that it is not absolutely the, uh, the core of the discussion. It, it, it's, it's higher than it was, but it, I think it, it would still be, be higher. But then uh, but I would absolutely agree on, on the youth movement. I think that has brought a seriousness um, to the discussion that wasn't there a couple of years ago. I think a couple of years ago, even you know, those of us who have hung around the climate negotiations for too long, there was some sort of resignation there, or you know, sort of a bit of going through the motions, a bit of we'll do what we can. And it was only that mobilization of the, the, the youth voices which has really made it a really serious debate uh, uh, again. And I would also just um, un underline that fact. And one of the things I love about that is that they're really supportive of each other, raising each other's voices up uh, in different parts of the world. So it's not only just about the, you know, the most famous youth climate activist, fantastic though she is, but, but it's, it's about boosting uh, mutually supporting and boosting the voices of other activists uh, around the world. Thanks, Dermot. I'm with, time is running on, so I'm going to finish with one question that I'm going to aim to all of you. And the question is, look, COP is not going to solve this problem, but it may make some contributions. Can you each suggest one policy issue that would affect health that you would like to see agreed upon for tackling at COP26? What, if you could only choose one issue that you'd really like to bring to the policymakers' attention, um, and actually we haven't had time to talk about food, oh my goodness. Maybe Liz, you could choose a food answer for that because that's your special area. And I've always thought that the food security issue is immensely important given the fact that our countdown mm -hmm. report has shown um, drops steady falls in crop yields and stuff so let's I, actually i'll come to you first liz if you were going to choose one policy issue uh that would affect health and you'd like to see movement on what would that be 
Well, I'm going to I'm going to do what you suggested and, and talk to the food food and agriculture sector, um, which makes it easier. Then I don't have to choose one because it's been predetermined. But I think we need to put a lot of effort into helping um, low income countries to develop climate resilient crop crops and to help farmers adapt and build resilience in crop systems. Food security is really complex and I know food production is only a part of it and I don't have 10 minutes. So I would just say um, we, uh, you know, climate resilient crops, building more resilient food systems uh, is going to help tremendously in terms of undernutrition, but I'm not naive. I know that's just a very small part of health, nutrition and food security. Thank you. I mean, it's very striking in the U UK plan for moving towards a zero carbon world, that the whole food agriculture diet thing is almost ignored, even though that's one of the largest contributors to emissions. And I find that disappointing, especially as having lived in South Asia, you, you've got the best diet in the world. Not only is it the tastiest, it's also very balanced and it's also very low carbon. And I think we should be learning from that. But anyway, thank you. I'll come to Marina next. What would you, choose as your one issue? Well, Anthony, I studied um, biochemistry and I've always worked in health. So I'm going to talk about economics at this stage, which is what I know seriously nothing about. But I honestly, I think that we're in a, in a very pivotal moment right now with COVID recovery and with all those uh, funds being injected towards COVID recovery. So what I would really like to see <laughs> at COP26 is that we really align COVID recovery with the NDCs, with the Green Climate Fund, and with the 100 billion that we need to give to, to low and income countries to enable them to decarbonize and adapt to climate change. And unless we align those two things, I just don't see how we will be able to protect the health of, of people now and in the future. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Almaz. I don't know, we lost you for a bit. Uh, the question is, if you could only choose one policy issue to raise a cop with our politicians, what would you like that to be? I think it, for me, it would be accessibility to water and sanitation. In South Africa, a large amount of our population lives in informal settlements, and these settlements are not equipped for inclement weather. <laughs> Waste management is not up to standards in these informal settlements, which accelerates the spread of diseases. And we, the youth, are hit hardest by this because we play in these areas. There was an extremely sad story of a child that was um, that lived in these informal settlements and was using a long drop toilet and fell down the toilet and died. In a civilized yeah. modern society, I think that these issues are unacceptable. Um, and who do the children look up to, look up to for sanitation? That's the government, which the adults vote for. What is what and sanitation, I think, is a basic human right, and this needs to be driven globally. And I can never only choose one issue to be focused on at COP. So I also think that gender based violence, domestic violence, is a big issue that needs to be addressed. Um, in South Africa, the COVID 19 pandemic created another pandemic, basically, a pandemic within a pandemic. During the first lockdown, men lost their jobs. They resorted to alcohol abuse and took it out on the most vulnerable in society, being women and children. And it got to such a bad point that our president, Sul Ramaphosa, had to ban alcohol to stop domestic violence. But after this ban, the largest hospital in Southern Africa, which is Baragwanath, their emergency ward was completely empty. And this gave health workers the opportunity to focus on COVID-19 patients. So I would like to see alcohol rehabilitation and regulating of alcohol advertisements to children. And we also need to have gender mainstreaming in policy to protect women from gender-based violence. Thank you. Beautiful. And, and your, this is music to my ears because we've been working with some academics in our Children in All Policies program um, in South Africa precisely around that issue of alcohol. It was prohibited partly because they needed the hospital beds for COVID. And it, and as you say, the Baraguanath experience showed that alcohol policy can have a huge impact. And we're trying to look at it in relation to child health because alcohol is the biggest drug problem in the world. And that is the one that has huge impacts on health in all kinds of other ways. But coming back to the climate issue, I'm gonna to move to Sunita, uh, and give the last word to Dermot. You've got to choose one issue 
Sunita, what's it going to be? Okay, then I will choose the most difficult one, but the most important one. I mean, uh, COP has always been talking about something called loss and damage. And loss and damage is about estimating the losses and paying for the damages. It's actually about polluter pays. Now, in the Paris Agreement, um, uh, something that um, 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 is, is completely ridiculous, it, it says that loss and damage can never be seen as either a liability or compensation payment. We need to rewrite this. We need to erase this and we need to make sure that in future losses and damages are paid for just like the principle of polluter pays is done in every civilized economy. Why should climate change be any different? And I think that will make sure that we will start looking at the cost for adaptation, the cost for um, you know extreme weather events being paid for, not as charity and not couched in all these different words. OECD actually even includes in its estimation of green climate finance, building of roads. So let's let's get some clarity about the fact that this payment has to be made as a matter of right and not as a charity. And that's why loss and damage is critical. Thank you very much. Dermot. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to follow on from a, a couple of those those points because I I, I think that probably the most important thing is the economics. And I, I, again, I completely agree with Sunita. It, it, it isn't just about the, the even the 100 billion um, in the, could, and, you know, the money that could be provided through, uh, um, through grants and so on, through the Green Climate Fund, because that, that isn't the size of the global economy. The size of the global economy is much, much bigger than that. And the size yeah. of the climate change challenge is much bigger and, uh, than that. So it's not about putting you know, 10 billion, 100 billion over here to fix the climate change problem. The whole of the economic, um, the incentives have to be changed in order to, to make that transition to a, to a green economy. And, and I'm also not, not an economist, um, but it does seem to me crazy uh, that we do, as a society, provide a, um, an effective subsidy of $5.9 trillion a year to the fossil fuel industry either in direct uh, financial subsidies or the mainly the or at least half the uncosted health health damages um and so i'm I, I, again without being a, an expert i don't know whether the way to do that is a carbon tax which includes evaluation of uh, of the health uh, gains um that will come from from cleaner energy but something about writing this uh, simply crazy economic situation that fails to value health i think is important I, i'm just quickly going to take the cue from from our youth um uh, representative, I think absolutely right to uh, don't settle for one thing, go for go for more, go for two. Mm -hmm. The most important thing, I think, is the recognition of uh, the right to health. It is in the front page of the Paris Agreement. The Human Rights Council just passed a resolution a couple of weeks ago uh, affirming um, the right to, I think it's a healthy, clean and safe uh, environment. Um, that really ought to be the benchmark. We should not be negotiating about some of these, th these things, we should be taking that as a basic standard and reorientating everything we do to guarantee that, that right to health for ourselves and, and, for, and for future generations and working backwards from there. Lovely, thank you very much. And I, I'd add to the economic stuff, I would say we have to have a price on carbon. And it, it you know, it's interesting because everyone thinks carbon taxes mean higher taxation. But actually, many people are saying, why are we taxing good things like income and not taxing bad things like carbon? And in fact, it was right wing economists in the Republican Party who came up with a scheme uh, before Trump. Trump, of course, ignored it, which was saying put massive taxes on the oil companies so that the price of carbon goes up. Don't take it into government. Give it right back to people straight away in terms of big benefits. Cut your income taxes and then uh, get people to make their own choices. Now, clearly, you have to protect the poorest because some people are very dependent upon it. It requires very careful working out. But ultimately, there has to be a price for carbon. And I think, you know, we have to think creatively about the way we structure uh, national taxes. But that's an extremely hot topic. 
for which I have no qualifications. So I'm going to finish on the panel here. Uh, we've got one of the world's leading climate scientists with us, Salim al Haq, who I'm sure many of you will know, who has been involved in all the developments over the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, I hope he's going to come in and join us and say a few words to conclude this before I wrap up with a couple of announcements. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Uh, good to see some uh, old uh, friends' faces uh, and congratulations to Lancet on uh, this uh, very exciting new report and I hope that you'll continue uh, to do this. So uh, I'm going to make three uh, short sets of remarks. Uh, the first one picking up on Sunita's uh, last point on loss and damage, which has been something I have been banging the drum on. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a very critical time to do that because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report, Working Group 1, came out on the 9th of August and for the very first time declared that they can actually tell that climate change is causing impacts and loss and damage due to human-induced climate change is now a reality and the numbers are, are in the trillions uh, that we are going to be facing. That's the cost of inaction over the last 30 years that we are all going to bear, including rich countries, by the way. And so uh, I characterize this as COP26 being the first COP of a new era of loss and damage from climate change, which is going to go every year, get bigger and bigger. And we need to take that into account and address it in ways that we just heard uh, has been suggested. These can't be ignored any anymore, although rich countries are still trying to avoid talking about it, uh, let alone admitting that it's happening. So uh, no, don't hold your breath that something will come out in COP26, but we must fight for it. <clears throat> the second set of remarks I'll say is uh, in, in the context of the food uh, systems, uh, which you alluded to, uh, as I've been uh, uh, had the opportunity to chair the Action Track 5 on resilient food systems as part of the UN Food Systems Summit. We did a massive amount of consultations with different groups from around the world, got huge amounts of uh, input, energy, advice, offers to do work. And the outcome of that summit, which is an unusual summit, it wasn't an agreement by countries. It was just a set of actions that different coalitions of actors agreed to take forward for the next nine years left in the decade to implement the sustainable development goals. It's about impl implementation. And a couple of the tracks, a couple of the coalitions and alliances under our track on resilience link, obviously, food systems with climate change, which is the big uh, issue now. And I think that becomes an integral part of that. And we need to be monitoring this uh, over the next nine years uh, that we have left of the decade. And so my final set of uh, remarks are uh, to the research community that has been involved in uh, preparing this report and hopefully we'll continue to work on further reports in future uh, and speaking with my my day job hat on which is a researcher based in Dhaka, Bangladesh at the Independent University of Bangladesh. Most of my work is working with the most vulnerable communities in some of the most vulnerable uh, countries including my country Bangladesh but also other countries um, and how to help them adapt and cope with the impacts of climate change. And that is an ongoing struggle where researchers have to play a big role. And I would argue that obviously collecting data, global data sets, global numbers are extremely important. But we must not lose sight of doing practical things on the ground with local researchers. And, you know, even the poorest country in the world has numbers of universities. Bangladesh has more than 100 universities. We've got good young faculty. We've got good young students, postgraduate students. They can all be engaged in collecting data, doing stuff, qualitative, quantitative, uh, involved. But unfortunately, in global um, scientific enterprises, of which I've participated in quite a few, that is an underutilized resource that we have. Everything is very north-centric. North uh, a few people from the south, like myself, get invited to these kinds of efforts. Uh, but I know hundreds of people who could contribute, but who never get you know, uh, called on. So let us try and be better ourselves as global researchers in including a, a very important resource of researchers from the most vulnerable countries uh, in the developing world as we go forward. 
And this is a long-term agenda. We're not going to solve it overnight. It's going to get worse in our lifetimes, unfortunately. Uh, we can pre prevent it getting much worse for the younger generation, but our lifetimes are locked into everything is going to get worse. Every day, is, every day is going to be worse than the day before. Every year is going to be worse than the year before. And we have to deal with that. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. I've, just a quick follow-up question. Um, I, I completely agree with you. I, I mean, having visited Bangladesh many, many times and collaborated with uh, academics there, I know how actually dynamic the country is in terms of research and also in terms of the innovations it's come up for dealing with climate change and I think actually we can learn a lot from that I mean I think in the in the so-called wealthy north as we've seen with the pandemic we have done a lot worse than poorer countries so there are lots of things that we can be a two-way flow just to say on the positive front that the Wellcome Trust are just announcing a big new expansion of funding and they've just appointed a new director for climate change and health who you may know professor alan dangor from the london school of hygiene and he's a food specialist and and so hopefully there will be much increased uh you know research investment from that very important organization but we need others to step up to the plate just a final question are you optimistic or pessimistic mm -hmm. a about cop and be about us ability to bring about adequate zero carbon world in time? <laughs> well, short, my short answer is I'm both. I'm pessimistic about cops and leaders. They simply have not delivered and I don't expect them to deliver in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm optimistic about young people. Almaz here is the person that I uh, am optimistic about. My students in my university are people I'm optimistic about. They're the brightest and the, the best of their generation they can make things happen and they are the ones i am investing my time in talking to uh, helping them capacitating them and actually treating them as my clients my prime minister doesn't need me the young people do thank you so much it's been a real pleasure to have you and i, I wish you were all coming to cop but um uh i don't think many people will be able to but uh thank you so much for the time you've given and the wisdom of your comments I've just got to end up with a couple more announcements, but thank you very much for everything that you've done to all of you, Almas, Sunita, Liz, Marina, Dermot, and Salimor.